Welcome, everybody, to this live stream. And first things first, happy World Quantum Day. My name is Desiree Lehmann, and as a moderator, I will guide you a little bit through today's live stream. And we are very grateful and happy that we are able to broadcast live here from Uptown Basel. Quantum brings people together and connects institutions globally, and therefore we are very happy that we have several international but also Swiss speakers in today's live stream to celebrate together the World Quantum Day here from Quantum Basel in Allesheim in beautiful Switzerland. Why broadcasting from this location, you ask? Well, it only makes sense as Quantum Basel is the competence center for quantum and artificial intelligence, and Uptown Basel has the first quantum computer hub that is for commercial use. So I'm very happy that we are here live and represent a part of Switzerland in today's Quantum Day, over 65 other countries that are participating in this amazing event. In this first session, we are focusing on four partner sites from Quantum Basel, which means you will get insights of the work of Professor Clément Javersac from the University of Applied Sciences, um, Northwestern Switzerland, from uh, Professor Daniel Zumbühl from the University Basel, Switzerland, and the NCCR SPIN team with um, the PhD candidate Miguel J. Garbaido. Then Serge Rosenblum from the Weizmann Institute in Rechovot, Israel. And then we go on to Dr. Daniele Ottaviani, coordinator of the Cineca Quantum Computing Lab, live from Bologna, Italy. As you may already have seen, you do have the opportunity to connect in the comment section and ask your questions and comments. And if we have time in between each speech, we would be happy to discuss your questions and comments. And therefore, I'm very, very happy to have two absolute experts with me by my side. Alexandra Beckstein, CEO from Kai Ventures, and Damir Bogdan, CEO of Uptown Basel Infinity and Quantum Basel. I will hand over now to you guys for that you can introduce yourself. And after that, Damir will already welcome our first speaker. Off to you. Thank you, Desiree. While March 14 has become a Pi day in reflection of the Constance Furt's three digits, 3.14, an international collection of quantum scientists has chosen April 14 as World Quantum Day, reflecting the first three rounded up digit, 4.14, of Planck's constant, the fundamental constant governing quantum physics. Welcome to Uptown Basel. Welcome to Quantum Basel. We are an innovation campus here in Basel and with one mission. Our mission is, beside the fact that we are fully privately funded, our mission is to abolish animal testing and to so support this with quantum technologies. Here at Quantum Basel, we have a broad array of technology partners which, with whom we are collaborating with, starting with all different kinds of quantum architectures, like superconducting with IBM, quantum annealer with D-Wave, simulators. But talking about quantum isn't enough. We also have to talk about AI, because the world's problems get more and more complicated, more and more diverse, more and more data is needed. And with that, more and more structure is needed behind. So within our hub, we want to help businesses, industry partners, from logistic companies, from life science companies, from industry 4.0 companies, with our broad ecosystem to help and to support the 
usage of quantum computing, here and now, within the next three years, and once quantum advantage is ready. We have a broad array of university partners, which some of will be present afterwards, research institute, and also startups. And with that said, I want to hand over to Kai Ventures, to Alexandra. Welcome, everyone. As you see, what we do here is we build up ecosystems. And as startups are a crucial part when it comes to ecosystem building, we at Kai Ventures, we give startups a ground to grow and develop here. And we do this by investing in them. We invest in global startups. We do this by offering them a one-to-one -one tailored mentoring and, most important, by giving them access to our corporate network, to world-class mentors, and access to quantum computers and the quantum services that is provided by Quantum Basel. And with that said, we want already to deep dive into our first partner from our ecosystem to the University of Applied Science. It's a great pleasure to hand over to Professor Clément Raversa, a professor focused on photonic and quantum technologies for next generation sensing in life science. And we will start with a short video from Clément. Clément, the stage is yours. Welcome at FINV, the University of Applied Sciences, Northwestern Switzerland. It's the School of Life Sciences for this word Quantum Day. So here we are researching how to apply quantum technologies to improve people's life and their environment. But quantum technologies are not new. Uh, quantum mechanics is actually already at the heart of a lot of uh, life science applications in healthcare, for instance. But so quantum technologies, it's not only something for the future. So let's have a look first at what is called the first quantum revolution, which is how quantum technologies are already used in today's applications. For instance, if we start with classical computers, they are made of semiconductors. For instance, a long time ago, they were made out these uh, vacuum tubes. And as you may know, now in computers, we have chips like that, where there are billions of transistors inside. And the theory of the semiconductors that makes them run is actually based of quantum mechanics, making diodes and transistors, all of these circuits. And of course, we would not imagine our lives without smartphones and computers. And in the medical sector, this has a lot of impact to analyze the data, radiography, exchange patient information, and so on and so on. So there is also another application, which are lasers. Lasers, like in this uh, little laser pointer, or in bigger lasers, like in this one. And they are used in a wide variety of applications, for instance, for DNA sequencing, or microscopy, image analysis, spectroscopy, a lot of applications in today's life sciences. Another application is for medical imaging, like some of the instruments behind me, like magnetic resonance imaging that you may know, very powerful technique to see inside the body. It is based on uh, looking at the spins inside the body, also quantum mechanics. And finally, atomic clocks that gives very precise timing that are used in GPS, global positioning systems, that are also used for positioning application within the uh, healthcare sector. This is all the first quantum revolution. These are things that are uh, around us for decades already. But now there are new quantum properties that we try to harness in the so-called second quantum revolution. Let's have a look. So in the first quantum revolution, it was mainly the discrete levels of energy of atoms that were used, the so-called quanta of energy. And in the second quantum revolution, we use new properties, quantum properties, such as entanglements. And for instance, they are used for quantum key distribution, which is the exchange of quantum keys to uh, exchange very, in a secure way, information, for instance, between hospital to carry uh, patient data. 
And this use existing classical networks, optical fiber networks, to exchange patient data, diagnostic data between hospitals, research institutes, and doctors. This is something that we are implementing today at FINV. Another aspect is on quantum sensors. So quantum sensors that we develop, tiny sensors like this, that help, for, uh, for instance, to better image the heart, to do better imaging of uh, the heart using tiny sensors to measure tiny uh, magnetic fields, or for better imaging of the brain um, uh, to help cure uh, uh, functions like uh, uh, Parkinson, Alzheimer, etc. So very tiny sensor using quantum properties to do very sensitive measurements. Another application is uh, to use also uh, sensitive sensors to discover the properties of molecules. And for this, let's have a look in the lab. We also use techniques such as NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, to look inside the structure, shape of uh, molecules, complex molecules, and we use quantum computing algorithms to decipher this uh, complex information that we get from these machines. And some of these problems are intractable with classical computers, and only with quantum computers we can extract information uh, out of this uh, spectroscopic data. Also. These quantum computing algorithms can be used to design new molecules, to design complex uh, chemical reactions, or even simply to optimize uh, healthcare supply chain for uh, drugs, uh, medications, etc. But most importantly, when we look at medically relevant molecules, large molecules, uh, to design new materials, new crystals with new properties, then quantum computers become very handy because they can help us to compute properties that we just can't with classical computers. And so you will understand that quantum computing is really the next step and there are a lot of challenges ahead. And in the next sessions, you will hear about our colleagues developing the qubits and the quantum computers themselves. And uh, we are very happy to see this development so that at the application level, we can improve pe people's life and their environment. Thank you. Hello, Clément. This was an amazing presentation and an amazing video and insights to your work. Um, welcome. And maybe you can shortly also introduce you as we now see you live. Thank you. Happy World Quantum Day, everyone. This is Clément from uh, FINV at the School of Life Science. And uh, I would have uh, maybe two little things to add. One is for people here joining from industry and wondering um, may, what uh, may disrupt the industry, what, um, uh, what they should look in. And then I would say approach uh, uh, Quantum Basel or approach institutes like ours, universities, to see what is possible, what is not possible, and what can be done today. And the second point is for students or young people interested in quantum technologies. There are new programs uh, really deep into the physics uh, to make new qubits, etc. Or at the application level to use this, for instance, in the medical informatics like we do. And go look at these programs. There are a lot of opportunities uh, for a lot of the jobs that are required now in industry to harness uh, quantum technologies. As today is all about synergies and connections, maybe you can share a little bit which institutions and people are at the moment the most precious one for your work, and maybe also with which people or institutions you would like to wish to work together in the future to get your work to the next level. So indeed, it's a, it's a, it's a work, uh, it's a teamwork, and for instance, for us, for sure, the 
Um, uh, manufacturers of the quantum computers are key. Uh, and here to name a few, uh, IBM as a partner of uh, Quantum Buzzard, but there are other ones from other pla uh, platforms, uh, D-Wave, uh, IonQ, Pascal, uh, quite a few architectures with different pros and cons. And uh, uh, so these are uh, who we are happy to work with and looking forward to, to work with. And of course, uh, people at the application uh, level, so people from industry, for instance, uh, that uh, have uh, high computational uh, needs, then uh, they should uh, uh, talk to us, and we we see what we can, uh, what tools we can use to help them speed up uh, or solve the intractable problems they may have today. Thank you so much, Clément. Maybe to you, Damien. Clément, thank you very much for this short introduction. I'm very glad you are with us, part of our ecosystem, and we are very looking forward for our next mutual projects. Thank you, Clément. Thank you. Damien, I think it's amazing how near such amazing things are happening to Uptown Basel and Quantum Basel. I mean, this is Fachhochschule FHNW, which is so near. How important do you think it is that that all these connections are happening right now? Because I have the feeling in quantum, it's all about synergies and open source and people working together. This is absolutely true. I mean, quantum computing as a science is not new, but we will hear it hear that from more from our experts later on, but it's happening quite fast over the last few years and something came out. We are not there like the chat GDP had the iPhone moment for AI as it's so called. We don't have this iPhone moment right now for quantum computing, but with the speed, with the accelerating uh, speed of quantum computing of the use cases which can already today be used for industry partners, we are quite sure that this will happen and we at Quantum Basel want to be in the locomotive riding this train. Clément talked about revolutions. The first step of revolution, second step of revolution where we are at the moment. Do you think that the third step of revolution would be this iPhone moment or do you see the third step of revolution somewhere else? This is a good question, and I'm glad you did not ask when this will happen. Never, so never. It will definitely happen, yeah. yes, absolutely. And referring also back to your first question, somebody can't do that alone. We have to do this combined. We are here at the World Quantum Day. There is a reason behind that. There are more than 60 countries contributing to this World Quantum Day. Why is that? Because we feel now that we will have a jump on the next S-curve, in the next transition of something that wasn't possible. Perhaps we will always use classical computing. There will always be hybrid solutions. But some part of the equation can be easier be solved with quantum computers than with classical ones. And once we elaborated on what part of this, uh, of this equation is better and how efficiency can be uh, gained through quantum computing, then I'm pretty sure industry will acknowledge the fact that everybody has to think about quantum computing. And this is our mission. Professor Clément Javelzac, that we just heard, um, also has a focus, a big focus, I think, on the medical field where quantum could be used. Um, in, in which way is Quantum Basel and especially also Uptown Basel connected in this specific field of medical possibilities when it comes to quantum? Well, one of our sectors is life science, medtech. This is definitely one of our focus sectors. And we also have to perhaps to distinguish between short, middle, and long-term advantages. And I'd say, if you look at quantum computing today, with this bright array of technology partners we will also have introduced in the afternoon, then I see that uh, logistics companies will have the first impact, then financial services industries, and then on the mid and long-term, it will be the impact on life science and healthcare. This is something which definitely will be here because we saw protein folding as one of the use cases. If you understand the structure of a protein, then you can, how, uh, you can help 
to perhaps influence it. And if we know that we've got uh, 10, point, uh, 10 high 62, uh, uh, by, uh, 10 by the power of 62 proteins in the body and only 10 by the power of 30 are already, uh, 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 how do you say, we, we know more about them. There is a huge potential in that. So coming back to your question, life science medtech is definitely something which will impact by quantum computing, but it will take a few years. I think we are already ready for the next speakers. Um, um, also, for you viewers at home, just a short reminder that you are able to write your questions in the comment section if you have one. But now off to you, Darmir, and the next speakers. Yeah, and we will stay in Basel. In fact, now we change. We go to the University of Basel. The University of Basel runs the NCCR SPIN. This is a Swiss quantum computing network where 36 associated research groups from the University of Basel, ETH, EPFL, but also IBM are involved with. And we are proud to have this here in Basel, and I'm really glad to hand over to Professor Dominic Zumbühl, the director of NZCR SPIN, and, as we heard, the PH candidate, Miguel Carvajillo. Dominic, stage is yours. Yeah, good morning. And welcome to the laboratory of the NCCR SPIN here at the University of Basel. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here today. And uh, as you can see, we're in the laboratory. So maybe we can just take a quick look at the cryostats over here. And uh, this is the actual equipment which we are using to test and measure and build the qubits, a bunch of electronics, and also the blue vessel which you see over there. It's the actual cryogenic experiment where we have liquid helium inside to cool down the qubit to about 4 Kelvin, which is the boiling point of liquid helium. At these low temperatures, we can operate our qubits. But uh, let me first start by introducing a little bit our network. So we're going to zoom here on the slide a little bit. So uh, the NCCR spin is actually developing uh, silicon and germanium qubits. These qubits are a little bit different from some of the other ones. In particular, they're extremely small and they're very fast. They're so small, in fact, uh, they're using the same technology that we are using to uh, have today's transistors and computers. So they're uh, measured on the length scale of uh, nanometers, and we are hoping in the future to actually be able to integrate millions, if not billions, of such qubits on a chip. So our main objective is to develop a fast and scalable electron and hole spin qubits. This is an interdisciplinary effort which combines teams working on quantum physics, material science, engineering, computer science, and also quantum information. And as Damir already introduced us, it's a network all over Switzerland. We're actually the largest uh, coordinated effort on quantum computing in Switzerland, combining about 36 groups uh, all through Switzerland, working on quantum computation. We're funded through the Swiss Federal Ministry of uh, Research and Innovation, through the Science Foundation, the Swiss Science Foundation, and our funding for the first four years is about 40 million uh, from 2020 to 2024. So now let's actually switch gears slightly and let me introduce uh, Miguel. He's a senior PhD in the group, and he will say a few things about the kind of qubits he is uh, working on and he's actually uh, measuring right now in this ongoing experiment, which is just right behind us. Let me finish with one last comment. I apologize for the slightly noisy uh, audio that you hear here in the laboratory. That's because it's a lab. We have pumps here and actually we don't have any birds in the lab. The twittering sound that you hear in the background is coming from a pulsed tube. And this is uh, one of the techniques we use for cooling. So sorry about the audio. Now I give it to Miguel. Thank you, Dominic. So uh, let me start by uh, introducing you our devices that we work with. And uh, I actually like to think of our device as sort of like the quantum Rolex. It's uh, very precise, small features, all handmade in Switzerland. So um, let me show you this picture really quick. Um, if you take a hair about a millimeter thick and you split it in one million equal parts, and you take 20 of those parts, you end up with the, the structure that we work with, which are these uh, germanium silicon nanowires. And um, below these nanowires, which we precisely place um, 
perpendicular to these um, to these structures are some gates with which we can apply voltages. And you can imagine what we're trying to do here is essentially sort of create wrinkles in a carpet to trap marbles. So this is uh, the way how we, how we are able to capture single electrons in these structures. And now by um, strategically applying voltages and uh, high frequency pulses, we're actually able to make the electrons flip and rotate and essentially um, produce quantum operations. So as you can see here, we have these classic pictures that we can generate, which these, these uh, chevrons, which essentially represent the down and the up state of a spin. So every time you see this bright color, you know the electron is in the up state, whereas when the color is dark, the electron is in the down state. And uh, when we now um, confine two electrons in our nanowire device, we can actually also do the first logical um, quantum operations, whereas you can see if our control qubit, so the left qubit, is in the down state, we can make the target qubit oscillate between down and up, whereas if our uh, control qubit is in the up state, the target qubit will simply idle and remain in the up state. So uh, let me show you briefly um, our uh, five chip here. So essentially, like I told you, we have these 20 nanometer small structures that are in this little chip. And then to, of course, make a connection from the quantum world to the macroscopic uh, outside world, we have these very fine gold wires which connect the quantum device, which you cannot see, to um, this chip carrier. And we essentially then place this whole thing into what we call a dipstick or the shaft of the stick, which has uh, several dozens of contacts with which we can apply the voltages. And now one of these contraptions is then, as Dominic uh, introduced before, placed into this uh, cryostat where we have this uh, very complex electronics which is going to help us control the qubit. So what you can see over here, if you follow me real quick, essentially what we're doing is we're uh, applying pulses of different voltages and we sort of load in the electron by um, sort of pushing into our uh, nanowire. And then once it is inside, we can apply microwave pulses of a certain duration at basically Wi-Fi frequency and rotate um, the spin. So we do these experiments several uh, Dozens of times, so a million times a second, and uh, that's how we acquire statistics for our measurements. Yeah, uh, sure, maybe like to say something about the electronics we use. Uh, thanks uh, a lot, thanks a lot, Miguel. Maybe I can add a couple of comments. So, right now, we're uh, still working on very few qubits one qubits, two qubits, Miguel mentioned, and that's because it's, it's extremely difficult to actually nanofabricate at such small length scales our structures. But uh, right now, we're working on understanding the physics and using it to make really, really excellent qubits where the error rates are going to be very low. And once we have that, then we are in a position to actually scale and go to a larger number of qubits. So that's one comment that I want to add. Another one is uh, we have to innovate on a number of different levels here. So uh, we also build some of the electronics that we use here to control these qubits ourselves. So for example, over here, you see a DC voltage source that's extremely low noise and very stable, and that's important to not introduce more errors on the qubits. And also to measure some of these smallest signals, we build our own pre-amplifiers. So these kinds of electronics is nowadays also available from our spin-off that we founded a few years ago. So um, let me now maybe uh, come to an end. I don't know how much time we have left, two minutes. All right, so let me say a few more things. So actually, uh, it's great to work together with many partners. So for example, at the IBM in Rishnikon, we work together with a number of teams. We actually have different types of qubits in our network, since we don't know yet which qubit will be the winner. You know, as you know, there is also superconducting qubits, there is trapped ions, and there are spins. And even among the spins, there are different types of spin qubits, and we're exploring uh, a few different ones at the NCCR. So together with the IBM team in Rishlikon, we're exploring another type of qubit, that's the thin field effect transistor, and we have a very close relationship and collaboration with the IBM team. We also work, for example, with the ETH Zurich team, for example, on coupling such spins uh, on a chip to, to many other qubits, and this can be done with the superconducting resonators, and for that, we collaborate, for example, with the group of Andreas Walrop at the ETH in Zurich, but also with the group of Pasquale Scarlino at the ETFL in Lausanne. 
So those are a couple of uh, comments that I wanted to make. And um, sure, maybe something. Yeah. For the future. To... Yeah. So in the future, uh, so now the NCCR is in its third year. Uh, we are just writing the proposal for the next four years. And in the future, we would like to go to a larger number of qubits. So now we have only two in the network. As I said, we're making the fidelity of these better. We're introducing some benchmarking. And in the next uh, few years, we would like to have small cells with maybe two by three qubits, so six or maybe eight qubits, and go towards larger uh, structures with much better error rates and higher fidelities. And uh, I don't know, is there going to be a question and answer session? Will you guys ask us some questions or should I just use up the full 10 minutes? Damiel, I think we will end the stream here. It was very, very interesting to have an insight of your lab. Thank you both. And as I said before, we are also very looking forward to collaborate further with you, with the University of Basel, because we see what's happening there with the NCCR spin can be groundbreaking, and we are looking forward to it to, to be partners of yours. But maybe we can, I just saw, we just got a question from the chat. So maybe if you're free, I, I just saw Samuel Spinden um, asked, you said that dozens of countries are working together. Can you say something about how far the current absence of Switzerland from Horizon influences <laughs> this collaboration? Yes, sure, I can comment on that. So indeed, quantum computing is, uh, is a race, you know, to build the quantum computer. And it's, of course, not only happening in Switzerland, but worldwide. For example, we organized a Qubit conference in the fall, and we had over 200 participants from basically all the continents. Uh, it was quite amazing. And right now, that Switzerland is excluded from the European quantum actions is quite severe. Uh, at this time, we still have running projects which were started before the exclusion, but when they come to an end, then this funding will stop and uh, we are no longer able to coordinate new projects. In some cases, there is now replacement schemes, but of course that's not so great uh, because we're no longer part of the EU network. So that's a very severe impact and the research teams here in Switzerland are really suffering from being excluded from these uh, European programs. That's, that's not a good development. And I hope that in the future, uh, our uh, government and uh, the diplomats can somehow come to a new agreement that will make this possible again in the future. Thank you so much. And we send out greetings from Allesheim to you, to Basel, and happy World Quantum Day. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Yeah, Damir, to have um, a team like NCCR Spin Lab so close to you, what does it mean for Quantum Basel? Well, I, I really think when you look back, it was in 82 when Richard, the physicist Richard Feynman first started to, to talk about, he proposed this uh, quantum computing. And in 94, uh, Peter Shaw started to showcase how quantum computing could once uh, crack the encryption standards. And then it was in 2002, I think, when the first, no, 2012, when the first qubit has been uh, focused on commercial business uh, was established in Vancouver, British Columbia. And this was 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, one qubit back in British Columbia, then IBM launched Q, which offered five qubits in, in uh, 2016. And now, if you look back, we today already have access to 433 qubits just on the side of IBM or with a D-Wave quantum annealing, another amount of qubits. And, and what we see there is that there are different kinds of architecture and standards which will establish. Will it be superconductors? Will it be annealers? Will it be ion traps? Or in the future, spin qubits, and every architecture has its advantages and its disadvantages. And the collaboration with the University of Basel helps us to understand which architectures are important and when can which architecture be used. Let's say the laser, the ion trapped or the annealers, they're good for immediate action in logistics, superconducting, 
there and a little bit long, long, uh, long lasting. And then uh, spin qubits, we think, will most probably be, will be the most advantage kind of uh, quantum computing, but then we are talking already in the 30s. And now coming back to years, you see what happens in six years and quantum computing will have more progress within the next decade than traditional computers had over the last three decades. So this is why a collaboration with the University of Basel, but also with other universities, are key. Then I'm really excited to step out of Switzerland for our next speaker that you may can introduce now. Yeah, we are talking about a global ecosystem. Quantum Basel is ramping up, and I'm glad that we are now going over the border. We are now live in Israel at the world-leading research institute of Weizmann Institute. And Weizmann consists of 250 experimental and theoretical research groups, of which are more than five in quantum computing spin-offs. And I'm very glad that Serge Rosenblum made it to us, and I would like to hand over to you, Serge. Thank you very much, and hello, everyone. It's uh, really great to be with you today on this World Quantum Day. So I am Serge Rosenblum, and I'm excited to share some insights with you about the Quantum Center at the Weizmann Institute of Science. Now, you might be surprised to hear that Weizmann is actually a world leader in quantum spin-offs. So let me tell you how we managed to achieve this. Now, um, Weizmann is actually a research institute focused solely on the sciences. We host about 250 research groups in biology, maths, chemistry, and of course, physics. Now, as a research institute, we only offer graduate studies, and that lets us, res um, us researchers and students focus solely on the research. We also have a very diverse uh, student population with about 30% internationals. And this approach really has paid off lately. We are now placed eighth worldwide in terms of impact of publications per person. And also we uh, recently managed to achieve the highest success rate for European research grants. Now our quantum center is home to about 22 groups focusing on uh, quantum sciences and technologies. And we're working on a variety of, of um, subjects such as materials, simulations, sensing, and of course, quantum computing. Now, although our research is always focused on the fundamental science, what's really impressive about Weizmann is that these fundamental studies were able to spin off four uh, different startup companies, all focusing on quantum hardware. And I think this is probably um, a world leading number. Our quantum center is home to, uh, um, well, it's subdivided into three different categories. We have a section focusing on experimental condensed matter physics, a section focusing on experimental atomic molecular and optical systems, so AMO. And finally, we, are, we have a theory section. Now, one thing that, that you can immediately see is that there's a very, hem very heavy emphasis on quantum computing. And we're spanning almost all technologies for quantum computing, such as superconducting circuits, uh, photons, trapped ions, neutral atoms, and even topological qubits. Um, but maybe it's worthwhile also pointing out that we have a lot of different uh, quantum uh, science going on. And Weizmann is actually a world leader when it comes to uh, scanning probes for quantum materials. But uh, before we go into some of these research groups, I think it's really important to uh, show you this image because one thing that's really important to us at Weizmann is uh, the positive atmosphere and creating a, a friendly environment for our community. We think this is really crucial to um, our success in research. Now, with that being said, let's now dive in into some of the uh, quantum computing uh, efforts uh, at Weizmann. Now, one of the most popular uh, platforms for doing quantum computing was, is with light. So particles of light are photons, and these photons can be used as qubits for quantum computing. But uh, unlike the movies uh, in Star Wars where the lightsabers uh, cling against each other, photons actually do not interact. 
one of the ways to make two photons talk to each other is by using an intermediary, like, an, like a single atom. And this is what's done in the group of uh, Professor Barak Dayan here at the Weizmann Institute. They use a single trapped atom in order to create deterministic gates between two photons. Now, the way they do that is by concentrating these two photons in this crystal ball you can see here on the screen. And this very strong electric field together with the atom makes it possible to create these deterministic uh, quantum gates. Um, this paper you can see here at the bottom uh, from 2018 was the basis for one of these uh, quantum companies that spun off uh, from Weizmann called Quantum Source, which are now commercializing this technology. But you don't have to have a single atom. You can also use an ensemble or many atoms. And this has the benefit of really enhancing the interaction between uh, the photons. Now, um, the, another advantage of using these ensembles is that you don't have to cool down the atoms. You can use them at room temperature. And this is what they do at the Furstenberg lab here at Weizmann. Uh, and another effort in that lab is that they're setting up a very special uh, tweezer array of atoms. So they trap the neutral atoms in an array, and this can be a very interesting platform for quantum computing. Uh, but not everyone swears by photons for quantum computing. Um, a lot of people uh, think that matter is the way to go. Uh, so we have the group of Rui Ozeri uh, in our institute that focuses on trapped ions. In fact, the Ozeri group was the first um, group that created a quantum computer in Israel. And you can see here an image of the five qubit quantum computer that they created with uh, very robust entangling gates that achieved state of the art fidelities. But now actually the Ozeri group is um, developing a 50 qubit processor, which would put them in line with the world's wide state of the art in terms of the number of qubits. And finally, uh, one of the leading technologies in the world for quantum computing is of course with superconducting circuits. And this is the approach used also uh, in our lab. And of course, by tech giants like IBM, um, Google and, and Amazon. So the expertise that we have in our group is to enhance the storage time for quantum information um, in our qubits. And this is actually maybe the biggest problem today with quantum computers, namely that they're unable to store their information for a long time. And I'm pretty uh, excited to share that in the past few uh, weeks, we've published a result where we were able to enhance the storage time of quantum information by more than an order of magnitude in superconducting qubits. So we can store our information for about 35 milliseconds. Whereas if you look at uh, standard qubits, they, um, they are currently limited to about one millisecond. So you can think about our storage qubits as a kind of a, a hard disk for quantum information. And we think this can really make a powerful impact. Um, and finally, of course, we also care about scaling up so we now have a six qubit processor uh, under development in our group. Now, above all, I think that Weizmann is not just a great place for quantum, but it's also a stunningly beautiful place to visit and have fun in. So if you're interested in visiting or collaborating with us, by all means, uh, please reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, Serge. This was very impressive. And we had uh, the chance in January to also deep dive into the research approach of Weizmann Institute when we visited you. And uh, I can really say it's about connecting different fields of research. And what I also appreciated a lot, that you have this strong effort to bring research to the industries. Now, as you can see, I do have Alexandra by my side. I'm really happy about that. Um, you have, with Kai Ventures, a deep connection with Weizmann. Maybe you can share a little bit more about that with our viewers. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, even if quantum technology in the most fields is far away from having a huge impact in the industries, there is some quantum technology that is already disrupting the industry. So my biggest joy is always to see when we have applications from startups worldwide or approaches from, uh, from research institutes like the Weizmann Institute to work together. And uh, 
with the, uh, the startups we get approached by, they are, a lot of times, they are from, uh, from Israel, and they come all from the Weizmann Institute. And uh, this is also what I see. So what we are talking about now with the Weizmann Institute is to start a collaboration in exchanging students, researchers, to bring the students to the industry here and also back to Israel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Serge, I hope you had a nice World Quantum Day so far. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Thank you very much. It's a, a really impressive cast you, you have here. Thank you very much and goodbye to Israel and Serge. Um, I already welcome back Damiel to introduce our next and already last speaker for this first session. Yeah, as you can see, we are really going a little bit more uh, global now and the next one will be even a little bit nearby. But before I come to this, I want to refer something small with what Serge has said. And this is at a quantum level science fiction appears uh, to become reality because particles can travel backwards and forward in time and teleport quantum tunneling between two positions. And so what we are doing now, we are just teleporting to Italy <laughs> and it's a pleasure for me to announce Dr. Daniele Ottaviani. He's the coordinator of Cineca, the quantum computing lab at the University of Bologna and Bologna was and I, I was very glad to be there in November when they inaugurated the Leonardo which is the third biggest supercomputer worldwide and imagine the power of combining a supercomputer a classical supercomputer the third biggest worldwide with quantum. So we are very looking forward to hear more from you. Daniele, the stage is yours. Benvenuto. Thank you. Thank you. So can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes. Hi, yes. Hi everybody. And uh, happy World Quantum Day. Very glad to be there uh, today. And uh, I'm here to present our uh, quantum computing lab in Cineca. And uh, first of all, let me spend two words about our uh, institution, Cineca. And uh, what is Cineca? Cineca is the Italian uh, largest supercomputing center. And uh, we were founded more than 50 years ago. And our main mission is to support the Italian and European uh, research, scientific and industrial research, with the supercomputing resources, okay? So through HPC, our main mission is HPC. And uh, we provide access to the most powerful supercomputing, uh, supercomputers in the market. And as you said, uh, we are the proud owner of the fourth uh, most powerful supercomputer in the world, Leonard, that was inaugurated the last November. And uh, we are also uh, able to give to our users a lot of uh, services like um, high-level support, uh, high-level support and services, and uh, um, education of uh, computational hours. In 2018, we decided that uh, quantum computing was something that uh, we had to see. We have to. Uh, we have to look because uh, we saw from the start, from the beginning, that uh, there's a lot of synergies between uh, quantum computing and HPC. So we see that uh, we see the quantum computer as something that can be used in the very near future as uh, an accelerator for quantum computers, for uh, uh, supercomputers, say, as we are using GPUs right now. And we started to investigate the, uh, this topic very early in 2018. And we created the, the Quantum Computing Lab, the Sineca Quantum Computing Lab. So our mission as Quantum Computing Lab is uh, almost the same that uh, the, the, the one in HPC. So we want to give to the users the possibility to use quantum computing as a state of the art in the best way possible. And we can say that our mission can be summarized in three main strands. The first strand is, for example, dissemination. Dissemination is very important. Dissemination is um, done with uh, in collaboration with the, the Sineca Academy and aims to inform and teach our users to how to use our quantum computing resources, but also to know what are the um, what are the the, the 
the main uh, advances in the field of quantum computing right now. So another strand that is very important for us is the collaboration with the projects, European and Italian uh, and national projects. And our main target in the context of these projects is to realize in collaboration with other research entities is to uh, make software, to make application that our users can use uh, when they access to our resources. So we create, uh, in this case, we are aims to create in particular hybrid HPC QC software that can be used by our user. And now our third strand is to uh, the, the topic of the quantum computing resources. Like we do with the HPC resources, we want to give to our users the possibility to use uh, quantum computers, uh, real quantum computers. Right now, we don't have a quantum computer installed in our data center, but we have uh, very big uh, supercomputers. Right now, we have Leonardo, we have Marconi Cento. We are in transition from Marconi Cento to Leonardo. And we give the possibility to uh, use uh, HPC emulators, for example, installed on our supercomputers. But also, we give to the, the possibility to, the, to use, to use uh, cloud computing resources. So, so we uh, made agreement, for example, with D-Wave, that is a quantum manila company, with Pascal, but also we are uh, working with IBM, IBM, with a lot of other uh, very important uh, companies to give to our users the possibility to use uh, cloud computing, uh, uh, quantum computing cloud resources. But of course, this is not what we want to do in the, in the future. In the future, we want to give to our users the possibility to use a concrete quantum computer installed in our facility. So we are planning to uh, give to Leonardo uh, the integration with a real quantum computer. And the, the occasion that we had to uh, acquire this kind of quantum computer came last year with the, the expression of interest uh, uh, from EURSPC joint undertaking that says that uh, the, with the publication of this first expression of interest uh, dedicated to the acquisition of a European quantum computer. So we participated, representing Italy, we participated with a consortium led by Italy and uh, formed by Germany and Slovenia to, uh, and we participated to express our interest to become an hosting entity. And we call it this uh, project EuroQCS Italy. And this project was very, uh, was evaluated very good from the European Commission, and they decided to elect Cineca as an hosting entity and decide to fund the computer that we are going to install and to integrate with Leonardo. The Commission also liked our project for another reason. And this other reason is, reason is the fact that we decided to, uh, mm, let's say, collaborate with other states in order to create not only a single supercomputing center with a quantum computer, but rather a network of hosting entities, in particular the hosting entities that are uh, enlightened in the slides so of France, Italy, Poland, and Spain, we all decide to participate to this project with the name EuroQCS. So they participated with EuroQCS France, EuroQCS Poland, and EuroQCS Spain. And all together, we decide to uh, give to the uh, AeroSPC joint undertaking not, not only the uh, single hosting entities with the supercomputers, but also something that is a network of uh, supercomputing centers that can collaborate together and give to the users the access to a lot, a very good, good range of quantum computers. Because one of the problems was the fact that when we had to decide what kind of quantum computer we, we wanted to install, it was a little bit a problem for us. Why? Because right now, nobody can know, nobody can say what is the best quantum computer that we can install in our uh, data center? Because we don't know. We don't know if the neutral atom quantum computer is better than the superconducting quantum computer, trapped ions, photonic. There are a lot of different kinds of quantum computers and uh, uh, digital quantum com digital uh, computers, analog computers, a lot of different kinds. And we don't know what is the best one. So we decided to, uh, to give to the European Commission 
the uh, idea of forming a sort of network with different quantum computers installed in our data centers. For example, we decided to install a neutral atoms quantum computer. France decided to install a general purpose, uh, purpose photonic quantum computer. Spain, uh, an, an analog uh, uh, superconducting computer. And Poland, a trapped diamond one. And in the, with this move, we decided to give to all the researchers in Europe the possibility to uh, access different uh, quantum computers based in Europe. We decided to integrate the neutral atom quantum computer with Leonardo, with a little bit of timeline of what we are going to, uh, to do in the next future. In the Leonardo, we decided to integrate a neutral atom quantum computer exploiting also the modular superconducting architecture that he has uh, at begins. So we, we will add a module, so we will start with uh, in, uh, within the, uh, the first half of this year with Leonardo. We will add at the end of 2024, a quantum module to our supercomputer containing the access to our neutral atoms quantum computer. It will be a 200 qubits analog quantum computer. We are expecting an upgrade in 2025, uh, becoming a digital quantum computer. So the main difference is the fact that we will uh, we will able to use to run every algorithm, uh, quantum algorithm in the literature with the analog one, not every one, but a lot of them. And at the end of 2026, we are expecting also another upgrade that will be uh, done upgrading the number of qubits contained in our uh, quantum computer. We are expecting a minimum of 500 qubits at the end of 2026, but uh, realistically, we can also expect 1,000 or something like that. And in the future, it will be the uh, first hybrid HPC QC heterogeneous system, in the future, maybe we will also able to add other kind of uh, futuristic models like the neuromorphic one. Thanks a lot for your attention and uh, happy World Quantum Day. Thank you, Daniele. This was very impressive. I like the vision, the notion of this neuromorphic model in the future, and I'm very looking forward to understand a little bit more what are your intentions are there. Thank you, Daniele. Damir, we heard so much about synergies and collaborating with other countries. Um, why Bologna? You see, in my first slide, I was referring to this ecosystem. And I also said that quantum computing as such will always be the best for industry when it's hybrid. So hybrid means the combination of classical computing and quantum computing. And if you hear now, and I've just read in the slides, and meanwhile, it's the fourth strongest supercomputer, Leonardo. And when you see the power of combination of the four biggest supercomputing with quantum computers, and we heard from Dominic Zumbühl with the question of uh, Samuel Spinden, I think it was, from the audience, asking about Switzerland being excluded from Horizon, then we think we, as a privately funded campus, we can make a little bit of a difference. We don't have any hesitations to collaborate with, let's say, the University of Bologna, with Cineca. We, we are really looking forward to be able to collaborate with those kind of partners as well, because we are not bind, we don't have any restrictions. We can decide on our own with whom to collaborate. And this is the reason why in our, uh, in our vision, Bologna uh, plays an important role as well. A huge advantage. Uh, amazing to see what Uptown Basel and Quantum Basel especially will create in the future together. And I think we already come to an end of the first session, Damir. Yeah, well, you, you, you just said a, a huge advantage. I, I want to make a fun fact about quantum computing now coming to an end. And the fun fact is, you know, the, the referral of a quantum leap and quantum sprung. Everybody thinks this is something huge. Uh, in fact, it's a huge, often sudden increase or advance in something or an abrupt change, a uh, sudden in uh, increase, dramatic advance. This is what we refer as a quantum leap. In fact, in physics, a quantum leap is rarely used uh, uh, in the scientific context because it is originated by the synonym of a quantum jump, which describes an 
abrupt transition as of an electron or of an atom or a molecule from one discrete energy state into another. So the smallest jump possible is a quantum leap in a scientific uh, context. But in, a, in the context we are using it normally, it means a giant leap. And why am I explaining this? Because I think that quantum computing will definitely impact industry a lot. And it will impact it not just in 10 years plus, it will impact us soon. Because the world is getting more complex. And the problems we have to solve, not just talking about climate, are getting more and more complex as well. And if you want to solve these complex problems, you need technology. And technology then, with more and more complex problems, more and more data comes along. With more and more data, AI has to be here to structure uh, the data. And, but AI is coming to a kind of limitation as well, with the classical computing, Moore's law, but also with the energy consumption. And talking about quantum computing is not just a combination of classical and quantum computing, but it's also given fact that uh, just a la aspect, the uh, uh, Nobel Prize laureate uh, uh, said this uh, two months ago, that one of the quantum advantages that it might use 100 times less energy for the same calculation as a classical computing. So if you know the problems are getting bigger, we need more computing power, but we have a way out to do this with less energy, then this is a kind of quantum advantage event and a, a, a quantum leap. I think mindset. these issues a lot of countries have. I see we have another question from the audience, uh, which says, great to see there are strong players in Israel and Italy too. What extent do these institutions cooperate with European industry? Maybe you can <laughs> answer this question, Damir, as an expert in this field. Yeah, I mean, those companies already are, uh, as we heard before, very much collaborating with in the, uh, European industry partners, as well as we are here from Switzerland, from Quantum Basel as well. Because we really think that there are no borders in this kind of technology. We are on the, on the edge of something completely new, and we want to understand this. And to understand it, you have to collaborate. And to collaborate means there are no nation borders, there are no canton borders. It is about a collaboration on a European, on a global re level. And this is why we see that it is very important for us and also for these other industries to cooperate uh, on a global, for sure, on a European level. Damien, I think we could go on and on and on and on, but we have to come to an end. Maybe your turn to say thank you and goodbye for now. Well, first of all, I want to thank you to all our partners from the morning. I want to say thank you to the University of Applied Science, to the University of Basel, to the Weizmann Institute, to the University of Bologna slash Cineca. But I also want to say thank you to our ecosystems partners in here, Alexandra with Kai Ventures. And I'm really looking forward for the next step. Also from my side, thank you so much to all the speakers for that. They were willing to share their work and get some insights to their laboratories, as we have seen. Also a big thank you to Uptown Basel, where this event is hosted. And of course, thank you to Damio and Alexandra for being a part of Switzerland that is represented in today's World Quantum Day. So. If you enjoyed this live stream, believe me, you don't want to miss the second live stream that will start at 4 p.m. European Central Time, here also hosted in Quantum Basel, Arlesheim, Switzerland. Um, feel free to join with the QR code that you should be able to see now, and you will have amazing speakers from New York, from Cleveland, from Silicon Valley and Canada, so you surely don't want to miss that. And until then, I'm wishing you a happy World Quantum Day from Quantum Basel.